it calms down. You can literally control a group dynamic if you'll use the art of the exhale. When you feel all of the angst rising in a room, let's say you're in a tough conflict style conversation, if you will just take a moment and relax your body and exhale, the rest of the group usually follows without even meaning to. They don't even know that they're doing it. It is time, time to let it shine alongside the lovely Lucinda K. I'm Dave Erickson. We are here to inspire more effective communicators by teaching you tangible, tailored steps of action. The lessons you'll learn here, we hope, will help you make an impact speaking one-on-one, in front of thousands, with the media, with clients, and family, wherever you choose to use your voice. And Lucinda just got back from sharing her voice in Jamaica. And you have uh, just a few freckles to, sh to prove it. <laughs> well, you know, I'm very intentional about protecting my skin out there in the bright sunlight. And how many years have you been going to Jamaica and uh, why? Well, I have been traveling to Jamaica since 1986. And we launched the nonprofit called Great Shape Incorporated in 1988. My mom and my aunties are the founders. And we launched it because we create family wherever we go, wherever we stand. You are part of our circle, part of our family. And Jamaica was hit by a hurricane, Hurricane Gilbert, in 1988, and it decimated the island. And my mama and aunties worried about our family there. And so we put on a reggae show, gathered all kinds of supplies, and my mama flew in on the first plane that was allowed in and delivered those supplies to the communities where our families lived. So Great Shape Incorporated grew from a duffel bag charity to now it serves 50,000 people every single year in Jamaica with free dental care, eye care, literacy training, teacher training. And Great Shape is one of my clients and I'm the communications director for them. And uh, so dental, dental health is one of the big foc one of the focuses of this? Health and education. Okay, health and okay. Yeah. And tell me about what it has, how has it impacted you on a personal level back home? Sure. It is a glorious opportunity to be completely filled up with goodness because you are serving other human beings and you're serving yourself. We're serving Jamaicans and we're serving volunteers and we then in the end get to benefit from creating so much goodness. Anytime you can use your skills, your talent, your brain power to influence and impact and enhance other people's lives, woo, that just makes you a stronger, more healthy, more stamina filled, more joyful, human being. And so my work that I do whenever I serve globally, including Great Shape Incorporated, it really impacts who I am on a daily basis. It provides great perspective, right? Mm -hmm. Holy cow. If you know what it's like to survive in a developing country, some kind of first world problem, that's not going to even be a blip on your radar. And so I know that I have a much higher standard of joy than a lot of people that I work with on a daily basis. As an effective communicator, when you, I guess, took this on, what were some of your first action steps that you saw a great need for and that where you could provide some communication skills? Sure. My team at Let It Shine, um, handles all of the internal and external communications for Great Shape Incorporated. And so that includes all of your regular public relations and marketing strategies, online, broadcast, media, international media, all of that good stuff. But what really makes my heart beat fast is that I get to provide the training and the coaching for volunteers, for the board, for staff, I have to be able to take a complete group of strangers that come from very diverse backgrounds from around the world, and I need to turn them into a totally in sync, powerful team within 24 hours. Because the volunteers only serve in Jamaica for one or two weeks at a time. We do not have time to dilly dally. Mm -hmm. We do not have time to waste a single second in a storming phase of a team. And all teams are going to go through all the same phases no matter what. And so I teach collaborative communication, and we have all kinds of systems in place to help teams be successful immediately. 
Wow. So you, how, how is this, um, this system developed over time? Because you, you, when you get there, you're assessing who you have, and then it's got to start small, and then you're slowly, I guess, t- uh, honing down the, the program? Well, collaborative communication is a specific technique that, that I designed and that I teach all my clients, whether they're nonprofit, families, corporations, and it's based on the three most powerful tenets of communication. The art of the exhale, engaged listening skills, and focused messaging. And so I apply that to every single layer that we are teaching these volunteers. And it's a fantastic Petri dish Mm. for me, right? Because it's super, it's a super concentrated experience. It's a very intense experience. And my volunteers are going to move through all kinds of phases at a much faster, intense pace than they would in their home countries, right? Where they have daily life is the norm and maybe at work it's challenge. But in Jamaica, everything is going to all of a sudden become challenging for them. And so it's this amazing Petri dish where I get to experiment with all kinds of communications techniques, training techniques, uh, coaching techniques that then I get to apply to all of my other clients back at home. So three steps, Lucinda. I know this is at the top of your head, which is great. Um, How can we apply this to outside Jamaica, maybe in a small group or a small business office. So the exhale, what does that mean? The art of the exhale is all about using your breath for fuel. Americans and Canadians especially walk around holding their breath, waiting for their turn to speak. And so this does two things. You're holding your breath, and then when it's your turn to speak, you take what's called a top-off breath, which is up here and it automatically puts your voice up into your head voice and then you have to speak faster because you don't really have enough fuel and so now you no longer have pausing and pacing and inflections in your message no longer means what you want it to mean, right? Mm. Whereas instead, if you'll just fully exhale, then you take in that nice clean breath before you speak. You're all centered. Even if you have adrenaline pumping, you have enough fuel so that you can use pausing and pacing in your sentences. You can use silence where you need to use silence. You can hit the words that are important to hit because now you have the fuel, right? Mm -hmm. It calms down. You can literally control a group dynamic if you'll use the art of the exhale. When you feel all of the angst rising in a room, let's say you're in a tough conflict style conversation, if you will just take a moment and relax your body and exhale, the rest of the group usually follows without even meaning to. They don't even know that they're doing it. But that's the way energy and breath works. We're kind of all in sync when we're in one place. So you can take control of a high angst situation by using the art of the exhale. The second thing it does is because you're holding your breath, waiting for your turn to speak, you're already planning what it is you want to say instead of fully listening to what the other human being is actually speaking. So then you're delivering all of your information from your own personal filter instead of truly hearing what the other person is saying or intending. And so if you will exhale while the other person is speaking and use those engaged listening skills, that means using all of your senses, nodding, being open to whatever it is they have to share, working their information back into the conversation, um, asking open-ended questions, linking their information to your information. Now the conversation becomes about really hearing them instead of what your own personal experience is. So that's engaged listening. The third step is focused messaging. That's being so clear about what it is you want to deliver in that conversation that you can speak it in one sentence. If you're in academia, that's your thesis, right? That's your thesis statement. It's your filter. It's your tagline. And you only share information that backs up that one sentence. So let's say you're interviewing me and you find out all kinds of things about me. I love Tillamook cheddar cheese. I love to sing karaoke. Uh, I love to work out. I love to serve human beings. Uh, I like to vacuum. I find that very centering. Like you might find out all these things about me, right? Mm -hmm. Now you're going to go introduce me and you're going to say, man, Lucinda Kay, she really knows how to let it shine. Which pieces of information are you going to not share about me? Out of that long list I just gave you. 
I don't know if, uh, well, it Back depends. Vacuuming and cheddar cheese. Do those have anything to do with shining in the world? Probably not, but it would be a nice little icebreaker. <laughs> it might be, but that's not the goal of your conversation. Mm. Your goal of that conversation is to tell people how I let it shine in the world. So that's going to, you're going to share the information about me in service. You're going to share information about me loving karaoke because I'm out there in front. Mm -hmm. You're only going to share the information about me that backs up that one sentence. Lucinda K really knows how to let it shine. Mm -hmm. Now the cheese and the vacuuming, that can come up later in conversation. But being, being focused in your messaging, you only share information that backs up your filter statement. And then it helps you clear out all that other clutter. It helps you be much more powerful as a communicator. Your filter statement. Expand on that. Is that uh, the, the who you are or the why behind what you do? What is the filter statement? The filter statement is, is your goal of the conversation. What oh. do you want to achieve with this conversation? So let's say, um, let's say you're trying to wake up your child in the morning. My child is hard to wake up. Let me tell you, my child is also messy. Hmm. She is cranky in the morning. She is often running late in the morning. Like all of these things are happening in the morning. So when I enter her bedroom, last night it was clean. All of a sudden, nine hours later when I'm waking her up, I don't know, some like totally messy fairies came into the room and messed it up, right? Mm -hmm. So when I'm walking in the room, I see the messy room. I now feel like we're running late. Uh, when I nudge her awake, she's cranky. Those are all things that I could comment on, right? Is she going to wake up? Is she going to get out of bed? No. My goal in that conversation is only to get her out of bed on time. And so I ignore the mess. I ignore the crankiness. I ignore the clutter. And I only focus on making sure I can rise her up out of her bed. That means first I kiss her awake. Then I step into her room and I sing her a good morning song. Then I come over closer and I might tickle her. And then it might get to the point where I say, you have three seconds to stand up. Three, two, one. And she's on her feet. So I could have been talking about all this other stuff going on, but my only goal is to make sure she gets out of bed. So I only focus on the information to get her out of bed. If you're stepping into conflict with someone, you could have all kinds of things that you're irritated with with them, right? Mm -hmm. It's your coworker. They're messy. They're always late to meetings. They always get in the elevator before you and close the door. So then you're late for meetings. Uh, they miss deadlines. There are all kinds of things that you could be irritated with them for and be in a conversation with them about. But you have to decide what is the main goal of that con of that conversation of that conflict resolution, right? So I would guess maybe in that moment you want to make sure that a deadline is handled appropriately. You have to ignore all of that other stuff that irritates you about that person and only focus your conversation on making sure you meet that deadline. This sounds like the art of exhale. You it take all a plays. You, for, if you exhale first, you get yourself paused and centered, mm -hmm. and then you are clear about what it is you want to communicate. Wow, this carries over into so many categories, not just waking up your daughter, but like you said, if you're in the office and you're about to approach someone and you know this is going to be a stressful, possibly a, a, a conflict of some kind. There's yep. that. Yep. There's with your spouse. There's maybe even with a with your pet. Yes. You know, your your body language, your attitude, your tone it depends on how you approach them. Yes. I mean, I walk in the house, and if my one of my dogs makes a, a mess, uh, if my voice changes, they cower. So it's because sure. I get frustrated. Like, did you really do that again? And there's a certain yeah. tense tenseness in my voice and they they know that something's wrong but if i were to come greet them because this is past due they don't remember that they right. made a mess right and i can see this the art of the exhale yeah art of the exhale engaged listening and focused messaging you know we both come from that uh, news broadcasting background and i know if i were to look at some of my earlier videotapes of my shows my voice was not there because of my my breath wasn't there Right. Uh, I didn't breathe correctly. And there's so much to be said for um, being calm. Yes. Did you it's have about to... having enough fuel. When I first started in the news business, I you know, was in my early 20s and I had that little girl voice. Now, I was a singer and I'm an alto. 
So I would sing appropriately and use breath and choir, but it didn't transfer. No one had ever taught me how to transfer that over to delivering, to speaking, to being on the news or being even in conversation, right? Mm -hmm. Until I had a co-anchor. Her name was Tiffany. She's amazing. She's in California now. And she said, Luce, you're an amazing journalist. You have to do something about your voice. No one had ever told me that before, right? Mm -hmm. And so I reached out to my early voice coaches and I went back into training specifically for how to speak. And it all came back to the art of the exhale and fuel. Helped me keep my adrenaline calm, helped me use my natural alto voice instead of that, especially young women. They get into such a habit of using that little girl voice. You know, it's super irritating to me, of course. (laughs) (laughs) But a little coaching and it fixed it. So I left, I was a freelancer at the time when I had the little girl voice. Then I got hired in Oregon, worked with a voice coach, and then got hired back into Washington. And I came back and the whole team said, what happened to your voice? I said, I spent the last six months with a coach and now I know how to use my voice more effectively. What a challenge to to find your voice, to find uh, your pace. And I, and I know the the art of the pause, which is yeah. still hard for me. And and I know I, I, I can attribute my speaking too fast, which caused me to stumble, as yeah. the reason why I was not hired back at a few stations. Mm-hmm. And I still struggle with that today, Lucinda. Mm-hmm. I still talk too fast. And I think it is that in my head, I'm already a sentence ahead before I'm done speaking that sentence how do you how do you how would you uh, suggest someone solve that if they're they think their mind is faster than their mouth? Yes. There she goes, exhaling. Silence is just as important as the words you choose to speak. Recognizing that silence in and of itself is a communication technique. Silence in and of itself is an experience. Silence in and of itself is just as powerful as the most amazing vocabulary word you can create. So recognizing that to be an effective communicator, you have to use silence just as much as you use words. And so when you use the exhale, and when you're learning, you choose punctuation to help you know where to exhale. So if it's a period or three dots, which I always forget. What is it? Ellipses. I love three dots. Me too. (laughs) Those are your moments where you're going to exhale and inhale and then begin the next phase of your sentence. But when I was in my early days of anchoring, I wrote out a sign. I wrote exhale and I stuck it onto the front of the camera in front of the teleprompter. And I marked my scripts as well so that when I looked down, I knew where to exhale. Mm. I marked my scripts with the style of face and tone of voice. Is it informative, pleasant, uh, big smile, serious, firm, sad? I had a set of just real easy adjectives and that's how I'd mark my scripts so that I'd look down and I immediately know, knew the kind of face, the tone of voice and the pace that should come with that script. So that's how I practiced in the early years. And then I believe in working with coaches. So I'm always good at doing my homework and I always do what my coaches say. Lucinda, this was a big challenge for me. Energy is a big a challenge for me even right now is because mm-hmm. I get excited and my speech goes faster and faster and faster because that high energy sets a tone for the conversation and shows my enthusiasm or, or interest in the other person. Yes. Um, but back in the day, that would just make me stumble over my words. And and in television, I know it's both of our foundation really, is you don't want any dead air. Mm-hmm. And I started up as more of a part-time reporter than I went into weather. That's mm-hmm. during the same time that we, we were uh, <laughs> crossing over into one of our stations. Right. And I remember them saying that you don't want to have any pauses during weather. You got to keep it going mm-hmm. and you can't just stop. And it, it forced me to... Uh, have very little pause between my period and my next sentence. Uh-huh. There's an awkwardness to that too. And what about the word, you talked about working with a coach, mm-hmm. the practice, practice, practice. Yes. How do you tell someone who is high energy to slow down? How can you maintain that high energy by with slowing down? 
Well, it is about, so when I work with clients, one, we want to uh, enhance their natural superpowers and we want to um, tweak their quirks. So we don't see it as strengths and weaknesses. We figure out how can we use already your gifts that you have in a more effective way, right? So if you're a high energy person and you're used to moving at a fast pace, what we do is we incorporate physicality more in you, right? So you're big energy. You don't have to do that all with your words. You can use big hand movements. Like when I'm in front of people, man, I stick my arms out. So I'm five, one and a half, but I can take up a lot of space. And even if I'm low energy that day, I know how to make it look like I'm high energy, right? Mm. And so for somebody like you, it's going to be about big body movements. It's, and it's going to be about creating enough space for you so that you can do your big body movements. Uh -huh. And just because you're using pausing and pacing and exhaling, you can still, when you get excited, speak at a super excited clip, right? And it's just about enunciating more and speaking more in the front of your mouth using this zygomatic zone right here and really work treating your face um, as a group of muscles, just like you would your body. So many people don't pay any attention to how their lips move or their cheeks move or your eyebrows move. And I'd make you do all kinds of exercises in front of the mirror where you could work on really controlling each of those different muscles so that then it becomes about taking tangible steps, carrying out action instead of such a lofty idea of you really need to slow down. Mm. Here's a good example since we're here to help uh, more effective communicators. This is mm -hmm. one of those tailored steps of action, I hope, is when I was learning speech pattern as a news anchor reporter is they talked about body language and mm -hmm. to use your hands to tell the story, which forced me to slow down because that was my problem still is. So if I were to say uh, the airplane took off and then and then crashed and all the people ran from the, the burning plane, I would use my hands. I'd say the airplane took off and suddenly crashed. Yes. And these motions forced me to talk in the motions. Yes. Which, which created natural pauses or natural inflections. And yes. then I would say, I, I, then I'd say all the people ran away because mm -hmm. there was fire and I'm mm -hmm. using my hands like an Italian. I would, that's what they said. Act like you're an Italian and you're always talking with your hands. Sure. And that really helped me pause. And the challenge was that, luckily, no one would see that during the video element on television news because we call it voiceovers. So mm -hmm. I'm back behind the scenes using my hands to do this. So I look right. like a crazy person, mm -hmm. but it doesn't come across that way. So exactly, this is one of those practice steps of using your body, like you just said, and walking through the storytelling process. Yes. And also... Uh, you want to use your hands even when you're face to face with people because research shows that people perceive you as more credible when you use your hands. People who don't use their hands are perceived as less credible. So you could be standing next to the smartest person in the world, but you're using your hands to deliver the same information. I'm going to appear smarter than the guy who actually got better grades than me who just stands stiff and doesn't use his or her hands. Would that also make someone appear more approachable because they're animated, they're yes. almost, I can touch you versus the person who is you know, stoic in their delivery? Yes. yes. And so what I teach is it doesn't matter what you're natural. You can be the most shy, introverted person in the world. But if you can, if we can define behaviors and action steps, you can carry them out and then you won't get in the way. You never want the messenger to get in the way of the message. Right? Mm -hmm. It's all about breaking it down into steps we can all take. It doesn't matter what our natural tendencies are. We can all carry out behaviors. Another thing I, I think for people who might be shy, because I was shy, and it's so strange that sometimes people who are the shyest are the ones that get in front of the camera or mm -hmm. the ones that are seeking out the attention. It's, it's a weird, a weird type of uh, back and forth. Uh, but because I was shy, I wanted to break out. I wanted to have an, a certain personality. And when I was taking coaching lessons during the Tri-Cities era, back in the mm -hmm. mid to late 90s, uh, the person would have me, the coach would say, now read this story to me aloud like you were doing it on the news. And I was so uncomfortable because they were a captive audience. And mm -hmm. I, I felt like I don't want to, I, I was too tense. I was too tight. Mm -hmm. Do you have any examples of this practicing breaking out of your shell or 
just getting like you're on stage. I mean, that's a very vulnerable place to be when you're walking up there. There's no place to hide. You don't have a podium. You don't have a desk and Mm -hmm. you're being animated. That may not be you. That's probably where someone would end up because that's a pretty high level. Mm -hmm. How do you get to that person who is hiding behind their computer desk and to that point, maybe the first couple of steps, how do you break out of that shell? Yeah, well, I mean, first we talk about the philosophies of communication and then I assess what their tendencies are and then I make recommendations as to which pieces we're going to work on. And I literally choreograph how to ah. how to stand up out of a chair, how to move out from beside the desk, how are you going to walk up the stairs, where are you going to walk on the stage. So I turn it into a list of steps that the person is going to carry out Instead of, again, that lofty idea of public speaking, Mm -hmm. which is so scary for people, instead, we're breaking it down step by step. This is how you place your hands on the armrests and rise from your chair. This is when you exhale. This is how I want you to walk up front. These are the kinds of shoes you're going to wear so that you can own your space, right? We break it down into all those what appear to be smaller steps, and then when you add them up, they just make you look like a rock star. So somebody can literally look more effective in 24 hours. One session with me, if they will follow like the 10 steps, they're already going to appear more effective and powerful than they were the day before. That, that's part of the key, isn't it, is, is how you present yourself. If you yes. a, appear confident, sometimes the message is not as important as how you deliver the message or I guess the, the way you what do the that, right? What the message is. Yeah. You, can, you, can, you can have the most gloriously written speech, but if you deliver it poorly, they will not hear one word. Mm -hmm. Whereas you can write a completely crap speech, but deliver it with gloriousness and people will be inspired to move mountains. Right. But if they actually read the script, they would be (laughs) what the heck? She didn't say anything. But it's how you say it. You have to decide how you want to be perceived in life, Mm. no matter where it is, with your family, with your kids, at work, out there on the street. You have to decide, how do I want to be perceived? And then define what that behavior looks like and then carry it out. That's how you'll be perceived. Not everyone is made for public speaking, though, are they? Or can can they be, is is there the difference between is it innate or can it be taught? Oh, I believe I can teach it. Yeah? Yes. I believe that we all have natural gifts, sure, from the time we are kids. And then we can hone those gifts to be used in all different kinds of areas. I have had clients that are so introverted and quiet. I had one amazing uh, woman who's successful and has a family and everyone perceived her as this quiet little mouse, and she's brilliant. And she came to me and she said, I'm tired of being silent. Mm. And we worked together for a couple of months, and now she speaks in front of groups, and she gets better and better all the time, and now people perceive her in a completely different way than they did a year ago. Wow, just open that one door, and then there they are. And yeah. some of people are just afraid to open that door to, to see how great they are, right? Yeah. And man, nature versus nurture. I mean, I have all kinds of Petri dishes to prove that correct, right? Mm-hmm. The two girls that I'm raising come from other countries, Jamaica and South Korea. And they are completely different beings than they were when they first came to live with me. In Jamaica, I get every single project I lead, I get to see... People blossom right before my eyes in real time. So I get to prove it to myself and to the world every single opportunity that I get to coach people. It takes work Mm -hmm. and it takes commitment and you have to avoid fear. You can never let fear make a decision for you. So once we move through the fear factor, people can behave any way they want to behave. Well, those are the two biggest emotions and uh, motivators in our lives are fear and desire. If you just say, no more fear, let's use the desire to propel us forward. Sure. You know, um, I don't want to, I don't know, we're kind of getting long on time, but you you talked about 
you know, the mechanics of going through the process of maybe walking on stage. Here's where the curtain is. Here's the steps. Let's practice going up the steps. Here's where you put your hands on the podium. Or maybe yep. when you're walking, we're only going to put one hand in your pocket right. and, and, and use your other hand when you're speaking. That You do this because the message is pretty much the message, but you have to shape, I guess, the, the messenger because we yes. all have a good message or we all have a, we, the message is there. We don't have to really teach the message if it's already set. It's, it's how well, we once deliver they system. Once they understand focused messaging, mm. right? Usually people, when they're preparing their presentations, they just add in way too much information and it no longer backs up their filter statement, right? So once they understand how to write a good presentation and to keep it focused, now we've got a strong message. Now we have to make sure the messenger isn't getting in the way. So there's an order to all of this of don't worry, don't try to be the uh, the great delivery, uh, do the delivery mechanics, get your message first, and then we can work on how we deliver that message. Uh, it all happens simultaneously. Oh, does it? Yeah. Okay. For sure. Was- but in the beginning, the great thing is that when clients first work with me, obviously, I mean, not obviously, but many times they have presentations to give. So in the beginning, I can edit all of their presentations to make it ready for verbal delivery, you know, in a hot second while I'm working on their skills. And Mm. then through the process, now they're learning how to write their own presentations to be more effective and then it all matches up. But in the beginning, that's easy for me to do for them on their behalf. One final thing before we kind of wrap up this episode. Sure. Let's humanize Lucinda for one more moment here. Do you still get nervous before you go on stage? So nervousness and adrenaline feel exactly the same. Okay. It's all in how you perceive it. Mm. When you're nervous and you're full of adrenaline, your hands shake, your kneecaps shake, your heart beats fast, you get sweaty, uh, dry mouth. And so I choose to perceive it as adrenaline because if I perceive it as, when people perceive it as nervousness, that's a stopper. That's a negative and it can paralyze your movement. But everyone knows adrenaline is about action, Mm -hmm. forward movement. And so I use the perception, my filter is that I am feeling full of adrenaline. And then I manage myself accordingly. I'm never going to hold paper in my hands while I'm presenting because I am full of adrenaline and my hands are shaking, my kneecaps are shaking, (laughs) but I know how to control my breath and I know how to use pausing and pacing and I know how to use my body and when and where to move so that I'm releasing the adrenaline and using it for good instead of evil. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> there is no overnight success. We know this takes a lot of time that yes. Lucinda, where you are right now, took you a, a while to get there. What we see in the finished product, there were hours, years, obviously, of practice and honing and getting that message focused. All things are possible mm-hmm. for each and every human being. Thank you for letting us see your inner sunshine. <laughs> As we uh, learn about collaborating, was it you called a collaborate? Collaborative communication. Collaborative communication. Yes. All right. Good three steps there. Let's uh, recap them for us first. The art of the exhale. The art of the exhale, engaged listening skills, and focused message. And Lucinda, just uh, where are some more, where, where should people go if they want to follow up more on your background and your services, for example? Sure. My website is letitshinemedia.com and I have a blog there as well so they can read past articles. And if they want to find out more about Great Shape Incorporated, everyone is welcome to volunteer with us in Jamaica. And that website is greatshapeinc.org. We will continue our Let It Shine series next week and uh, we hope you join us then. Thanks, Lucinda. Thanks so much, Dave. Let it shine. Don't let me hear you say light, taking you nowhere. Angel. Look at that sky, life's begun. Lights are warm and the days are young.